Welcome to the Business of Story podcast, where the world's best storytellers from business, Hollywood, and beyond teach you how to use stories to communicate and connect with your customers. The Business of Story is sponsored by ACT, the best-selling customer management software for small business, Oracle Marketing Cloud, enabling businesses to target, engage, convert, analyze, and use marketing technology to deliver a better customer experience. Sixter, helping clients maximize the impact of every single email sent and by signal labs the real-time cross-media story tracking platform here's your host park howell from park and co and today's special business of story guest welcome to the business of story where we explore the intersection of commerce and storytelling to help you all of our wonderful listeners how to use storytelling to help advance your missions and your brands and your programs further faster. Hi, I'm Park Howell. With me today is a great friend of mine, Bruno Sarda, who works with Dell. And Bruno and I teach together at Arizona State University in their School of Sustainability. Today, it's great to have Bruno here because this gentleman has actually traveled the world talking about not only uh, Dell computers, but he is a true voice for sustainability, and storytelling is at the core of everything that Bruno does. Welcome to the show, Bruno. Well, hi, Park. Thanks for having me. It's so awesome to have you here. You and I got a chance to meet a few years ago at a conference here in town, and we became fast friends. It turns out that Bruno lives just around the corner from the office. But you didn't start here in Phoenix, did you? No, no. I've uh, I've had a checkered uh, checkered relationship with uh, with Arizona. But uh, first moved here actually 30 years ago in uh, um, from Paris, France, where I grew up. Um, and uh, since then, I've lived in I've lived in California. I've lived in Texas. I've lived in Dublin, Ireland, um, and I've been back in Arizona now for several years. Now, I've been around your neighborhood in Paris, and I can only imagine when you moved out here, you were, what, like in the 10th grade, 11th grade? <laughs> 11th, or 12th, actually. 12th grade, so that must have been quite a transition from downtown Paris to Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah, that was uh, that was quite a culture shock, I have to say, uh, uh, back... Uh, Back in those days, I mean, Phoenix was a much smaller town than it is today, and uh, and not nearly as uh, as cosmopolitan. I would say uh, it was very hard to find uh, a cup of espresso, for example. You had to go up to the Borgata in Scottsdale. That's the only place I knew how to uh, where to find a cup of espresso, for example. Um, but um, but I endured, and uh, and it was it was kind of the Wild West. Uh, uh, the, the Wild West of, uh, of those Western movies I had seen growing up, so, uh, so, so there was a lot to discover. Well, speaking of the Wild West, we were just in France a month or so ago. Brett, Bruno and I were working with ASU actually down in Amsterdam, and uh, our wives and Bruno and I got a chance to get together for a day in France, and i got to tell you, it was the most fun I ever had. Bruno borrowed his brother's car and they took us for a wild ride kind of like uh, mr toad's wild ride at the amusement <laughs> park all through paris down to the south of paris to a beautiful uh, park down there and we just had a ball so it was fun to experience paris with a parisian even though you've been transplanted here for a number of years yes <laughs> now bruno you are the director of sustainability operations for dell yes what does that entail well, it's it's not a great title to be sure, um, uh, but so far I haven't come up with a better one. Um, it really is the business end of sustainability. So I'm, I'm not a scientist. I have a business background, uh, and when and communications and marketing background, don't you? Right. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, uh, it was my, my role is really about business management, business integration, business strategy of sustainability. So how to make business sense of sustainability at Dell and how to integrate sustainability into business at Dell. Mm -hmm. In our work together, you've been working and teaching over at ASU for what, five, six, seven years? Uh, no, about four and a half now. About four and a half years. And you are an adjunct professor as well as a senior sustainability scholar for the Global Institute of Sustainability at Arizona State University. And I have to keep looking over my shoulder to read all of uh, Bruno's titles because he's <laughs> quite accomplished not only in the business world, but certainly in the sustainability world. So 
at the heart of sustainability, and, and so everyone knows that Bruno and I teach together, he was kind enough actually to bring me into the program, the Executive Masters for Sustainability Leadership Program um, that is at Arizona State University as a part of the Rob and Melanie Walton uh, Sustainability Solutions Initiatives. Man, it's hard to get all of those titles out. But uh, Bruno uh, teaches the global context thread. I teach communications and storytelling, and we have two other incredible instructors in Dr. George Basil, who teaches strategy, and Dr. Kevin Gazzara, who teaches leadership. Anyway, Bruno, everything that you have done within your career, and certainly what you've done in sustainability now, has revolved around being able to connect with people and explain the engineering, the data, the jargon that often sustainability professionals get lost in. And believe me, you, know, you and I have been to enough conferences that you sit there and you listen to these mind-bending presentations. How have you brought story to your work, not only at Dell, but in your earlier in your career, and especially in sustainability? Well, you know, I find in my, in my work, I've often had to help lead disruptive change and transformative change um, for the last several years in sustainability for about 15 years before that it was really about the internet I was kind of at the inception of a lot of uh, internet based commerce I spent about 10 years with Charles Schwab uh, and changing actually not only how the internet permeated the organization but how it transformed the, the experience of the individual investor um, uh, through the power of their computer and the internet and um, what I find is change is hard, <laughs> uh, even when it's change people want, you know, and we all know that. I mean, we all want to get more fit. We all want to, you know, we all have these resolutions. There are things we want that require us to change, and change is hard because we're set in our ways. There's routines, there's distractions, there's barriers, there's all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, dragons along the way that, uh, uh, that get in the way. So part of what I found works really well is to get people really excited about the desired outcome. Because if you get excited about the desired outcome, the right desired outcome, mm -hmm. um, then it makes all the work needed to reach that outcome easier. Uh, because you can always relate it back to what am I doing this for? And I find, for example, for many people that I talk to, and I'm certainly not an expert in this field, but for example, losing weight is a good example. Like at the end of the day, like weighing less I mean, it's not something that's really exciting, you know? Right. People, maybe they want to look better, maybe they want to feel better, maybe they want to be able to do something again that they weren't able to uh, to do for many years. So it's, you know, for example, if you focus on, I want to, you know, lose weight, that's not necessarily a great goal. So um, I find it's the same in, in sustainability. You're trying to describe a future state that most people will agree is better mm -hmm. uh, and then you get them then to agree that in order to reach that desired future state um, that things will be needed uh, change will be needed uh, behavior modifications will be needed um, and you try to describe that positive uh, or that desired future outcome in some kind of affirmative or positive state so it's something you want more of or something you want to see happen you don't want to describe that future state as a negative as mm -hmm. something you don't want so you know which is a problem sometimes in sustainability we talk about avoiding all kinds of bad things but again we're not very good at that as as human beings you know whether it's what we eat whether it's for people who smoke or, or driving more or less safely. You know, avoiding problems, avoiding catastrophe isn't something that is ultimately a very strong motivator. But wanting something really bad and working for it, that we know how to do. So you want to tell stories that future people say, this is the story, the journey that you want to get into now because you really are trying to get to this end goal. So you start with the end in mind. You start with the end in mind and then you make sure you sell the why, not mm -hmm. just the what. So, so you describe, here's where we're trying to go. Here's why that matters. Here's mm -hmm. why that's important. Here's why that's better. Here's how it's going to feel, right? So you try to, to, to get people to, to uh, experience what that future state might feel like. Um, because, again, that really gets um, to a different set of, of emotions. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it's for them, maybe it's for somebody else. 
but again, you try to really describe it to use uh, stories, to use examples. You know, we really try to bring kind of a face and a name and color and pictures. And, you know, when we're trying to tell our sustainability story, even though it, it's um, uh, also filled with, with data and numbers and science and just the statistics and, and chemical formulas and all kinds of things, yeah. at the end of the day, it's uh, uh, it's about the individual stories, whether it's it's the um, uh, women entrepreneurs were helping uh, rise out of poverty in Kenya through a different way to harvest e-waste and keep it out of the environment, or whether it's our solar-powered classrooms in South Africa and how they're enabling uh, uh, children who live literally in towns where there's no electricity or school buildings to have uh, you know solar-powered uh, mobile classrooms uh, and have access to technology and the internet to uh, have a window into the world and, and an opportunity and a different kind of education. So, you know, trying to tell the stories, trying to show what it would mean for, for these individuals, uh, as opposed to just saying, you know, we want to increase education by X through the power of technology, because that's, it's good too. It's just not quite as inspiring. Yeah. So let me ask you your why story. Why did you get into sustainability? Um, well, it's... It's probably a story that started a long time ago. You know, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, I grew up in France. Um, one of my childhood heroes was Jacques Cousteau, you know, the, the, the famous uh, oceanographer whom um, I really admired, not just because of what he stood for, but how he went about doing what he did. He was, he was a, an inventor. He was an amazing storyteller. He invented the Aqualung, you know, which is basically mm -hmm. what became the scuba equipment that everybody uses today. Um, he invented all kinds of new technologies like underwater cameras uh, in order to be able to document what he was trying to do. Um, his mission was to tell great stories about how beautiful the oceans were beneath the surface. Uh, he lived in a time when um, you know, many people thought once you threw something in the ocean and it kind of cleared beneath the surface, it's like, boom, it's gone. It's Problem gone. solved. Out of mind. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I found that a really inspiring and he, and he was always such a positive character. He was, he loved to tell positive stories about, about people, about communities, about ecosystems. He wasn't about trying to blame or shame people, but really about making us love what he loved so that we would all want to protect it. So I think that's where really my personal ethos started. I, had a, I was fortunate my grandparents had a summer home on the coast of Spain, mm -hmm. so I would spend weeks every year there and got to snorkel for hours every day and, and later on, you know, scuba dive. And so got to kind of connect directly with part of what uh, Cousteau was talking about. And I got to experience a lot of what he was talking about, a lot of trash, a lot of people had thrown all kinds of garbage into the water from boats or from the from the shore um, and so um, I always had this personal commitment or, or connection to to nature uh, uh, and this importance of, of not polluting it now um, I studied marketing minored in Spanish actually uh, I went to work originally again in financial services mm -hmm. uh, got caught up in driving internet adoption and, and the rise of e-commerce. So for many years, I really didn't have an opportunity to connect my work to um, to this passion. Before I started with Schwab, I actually start, tried to start a business and then I realized I wasn't cut out to be an entrepreneur, but I was going to do environmental bioremediation. Hmm. Um, and uh, and uh, again, the great <laughs> idea, but again, it, it you know, it was about running a business much more than it was about cleaning up the environment. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, I was in my early 20s and definitely not, not right for, for that <laughs> at the time, uh, trying to, again, basically create an industry that didn't really exist. Um, but what I did learn through all my years of, of, again, kind of making this disruptive change that was the Internet mm -hmm. happen uh, was learning kind of how to do that and how to get people comfortable moving through change and um, and then one day, you know, I started hearing about what we were doing at Dell in the field of sustainability, started connecting with the people doing that work. Um, and then, you know, in conversations, we found that we had a lot of um, things to bring to each other. They really would help me 
connect to some of my personal passions and, and mission around uh, doing something greater than maybe just commerce. And then I could bring uh, to them this this kind of business discipline and rigor and experience of helping organizations and their stakeholders and customers move through um, this uh, this kind of change. So that's uh, that's how I got into sustainability. Well, that's great. Well, when we come back, because I would like to throw to a little story from our sponsors, I want to hear a little bit more about Dell and how you moved from the computer world or the technology world, I should say, into sustainability and the fun you had in that process. So more with Bruno Sarno right after this. Are you keeping track of sales leads in a spreadsheet or worse, post-it notes all over your desk? Well, there's a better way and it doesn't involve spending a fortune on complex CRM software. For over 25 years, ACT has been the number one best-selling contact and customer management software. It's super affordable and easy to use. ACT helps individuals, small businesses, and sales teams organize prospect and customer details in just one place. It also helps you market products and services more effectively, and most importantly, it drives sales. Try ACT for 30 days by visiting actstory.com and sign up for a chance to win a pair of Bose QuietComfort 20i acoustic noise-canceling headphones, a $299 value. Again, that's actstory.com. Well, welcome back to the Business of Story. And my guest today, Bruno Sarda, the Director of Sustainability Operations at Dell. Bruno, you are just starting to tell us about your work getting involved with sustainability at this great technology giant, Dell. How did that all come about? Well, you know, one would say that Dell became a business through uh, sustainability of sorts. You know, when, when Michael Dell, uh, you know, famously uh, started uh, building and selling computers in his, in his dorm room, um, and you know, ultimately became America's youngest billionaire, etc. Uh, he really invented a much more sustainable way of bringing technology to market, um, and really pioneered this kind of concept of very streamlined, just-in-time manufacturing for for technology. Um, so efficiency and speed to market, and and this notion of kind of build to order because really that was very different when Dell started basically saying you're going to order a computer and we're going to build it for you in like two days um, rather than build a bunch of stuff and then hope we sell it. Uh, fundamentally there's something very efficient about that so efficiency has always been really at the heart of the company um, from the early 90s Dell was, was at the table collaborating with the EPA and others on developing the first uh, Energy Star standards again mm -hmm because we got efficiency, uh, uh, in this case energy efficiency, was also on our mind. You know, when you sell as much technology as we do, uh, our customers collectively spend, uh, you know, billions upon billions of dollars in electricity powering the technology that we sell them. So even small improvements in how um, efficient the technology is uh, actually means a great deal to our customers' bottom line and, of course, to uh, to the environment as well in terms of reduced carbon emissions. So it's it's very much been part of our story from the start. Um, early, even again in the 90s, um, we were working with recyclers, bringing them in in the design stage and help get asking them to help us design computers that would be easier to recycle and disassemble uh, because something was recyclable that's great but it doesn't mean it's going to be recycled something that's recyclable will get recycled if somebody can make money recycling it um, and so if it takes a long time to take apart a recyclable computer um, nobody's going to have enough margin to make money off of the parts mm -hmm. so it's important for the product to come apart uh, fast enough for a recycler to make the decent margins doing that um, but not so easy to come apart that it falls apart when you're trying to use it. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, we started pulling some of these stories together some time ago, actually. Um, we published our first in, uh, sustainability report, although at the time it was called an environmental progress report, in 1998, wow. seven, 17 years ago. It's still on our website there today. You can see every report we've ever published. Um, and, of course, it doesn't have nearly as much as, as what we have in it now. But already we've been at this for a while. We, you know, we helped co-found um, 
the electronics industry citizenship coalition. We've been doing carbon disclosure since it started. Um, so we've been doing a lot of that. Uh, and again, these are all important, um, if you will, kind of corporate responsibility mm-hmm. types of things. Um, but really, the the story that has um, helped drive this all along, I think one is we're, again, we're a founder-led company. I've been fortunate to work for two founder-led companies for the last 20 years of Charles Schwab and then uh, Dell and both Chuck Schwab and Michael Dell are are very kind of charismatic, responsible, inspiring leaders. And Michael, um, who loves technology, I mean, there's probably few people in this world who love technology more than he does, but he says technology isn't about technology. Technology is about what it can do and specifically, it's really about enabling human potential. He's always trying to get us to think about what is technology good for, whether it's technology in healthcare, technology in education, technology in helping people connect, maybe through something like Skype, uh, technology in, uh, again, in, in industrial design, uh, in you know helping predict the weather or helping fly planes, mm-hmm. etc. Um, and so uh, from there, we've had this very strong kind of call to action around the company to try to think that way and to think about how does sustainability fit into that? How can we um, try to kind of unlock our own potential or our customers' potential through sustainability? And then you see some of what we've done. For example, we've, we've uh, had a very, very interesting innovation through our packaging solutions, mm-hmm. for example, um, with uh, uh, materials like bamboo and mushroom and wheat straw and actually methane from manure that we turn into a carbon negative bioplastic. Um, I'm going to interrupt you there because I want you to hold those stories here for a minute because okay. I love those and okay. I really want you to be able to milk those. But first, I know with all the great intentions, and you had shared this earlier with me with Dell, it doesn't always go the way you think it's going to go. Tell us about the time that Greenpeace draped a banner over your office. Or offices, actually, because they did in multiple countries. Oh, okay. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, part of what part of what is exciting about sustainability is is when, when you're early at it, you're kind of writing the book as you're going. And, and sometimes it's great and you get rewarded for it. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, you're kind of front line for kind of here's what not to do. Um, and, yeah, I mean, we've had our share of the stories. You know, we've had uh, uh, one particular example that I was sharing with you. You know, we had made... Um, a public commitment uh, in response to a lot of external pressure, uh, primarily led by Greenpeace and some other um, NGOs, to basically eliminate certain types of chemicals from plastics, so specifically PVC and and BFRs, uh, brominated flame retardants, and those are not problematic at all when the product is being used, but unfortunately, um, when uh, computers uh, reach their end of life, we tried as much as we can to recover them uh, through our take back programs and recycle them responsibly. But the fact is, a lot of it doesn't, hap- you know, uh, uh, get recovered that way. And you have all kinds of informal recycling networks in places like Africa and Asia, where um, poor people, often children, will burn the plastics to get to the metals because the metals have a commodity resale value. Promise is when you burn plastics that have some of these materials in them, like. BFRs or PPCs, they, they create um, toxic fumes that can be very harmful to uh, to the person standing next to them, uh, and or they can leach into into soils and, and water. And so, um, and a, none of us want that. But there was a lot of pressure on the industry to to basically change the chemistry of plastics uh, for electronics, and we responded to that pressure by being the first PC company to set a public goal to eliminate those from our from our supply chain and from our products. So that was the good part. The not so good part is, is actually we realized um, after the fact that the goal, setting the goal was the easy part. Meeting the goal was the really hard part and that we hadn't frankly done enough due diligence uh, internally to find what would it really take to meet that goal by the time frame we, we set. Um, and, you know, it came down to it would cost an enormous amount of money because we would literally have to have custom-made plastics that didn't exist for all of our competitors. You know, we 
we don't represent a huge portion of any one of our suppliers' business. So to request that the plastics that are, you know, enclose your cables mm-hmm. or something be made to a specific, uh, you know, formula, it, you know, it's going to cost money. And, and at the scale of Dell, it was literally like hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and um, while the industry was saying, well, we want to get there too, just not quite that fast. And so the sound business decision was to basically say, you know, we set this goal with a specific time frame. We're going to push the date out. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, Greenpeace got a hold of it. Yeah. But so they, you know, they called us out on it. And um, and again, not by sending us a letter, not by <laughs> picking up the phone. But you know, one day uh, they had activists scale our building in, in Texas and unfurling a banner saying "What the Dell?" Uh, and actually, they did the same in some of our global locations, including in, in Amsterdam, actually. Um, and you know, fortunately, I mean. Uh, nobody got hurt you know we said hey come off the roof and you know come into the office and we'll talk Um, and obviously a key lesson there I think is is it's important to set goal and it's important to try to set the ambition and to lead your industry in the right direction just want to make sure you do that the right way and Mm -hmm. so that you don't get caught uh, um, you know having to potentially backtrack and you know how you do that also matters and also, frankly, not also get too caught up in responding to NGO pressures because sometimes those are not necessarily the things that are the most material. You can have mm-hmm. very, very passionate activists in the space of whether it's it's chemicals and plastics or animal rights or childhood obesity or, or human rights. I mean, all kinds of things that matter, absolutely. But sometimes you really also have to... Um, focus on well, what is most material mm-hmm. to our business, and if we're going to spend you know time and energy and and money on specific issues, what is going to make the most impact? As I mentioned, energy, for example, is is probably by far the biggest um, uh, tool in, in in our box in mm-hmm. terms of making a significant global impact on on environmental issues. Yeah. And I imagine story plays a big part of this on all sides of it. So is, what is the story that the N- NGOs are telling you that are making you react to the tension in the marketplace that, that pushes Dell forward in this? What are the stories you tell yourself internally as to what we can really deliver on fact or fiction, but right. your heart's in the right place, you know, can't quite get there? And then, of course, what's the story that the rest of the population sees? And Greenpeace, in a reactionary way, may say, hey, this is BS on Dell. Even though your heart's in the right place, your intentions are in the right place, they they think they're going to come and, and, and call you out on it. So a whole nother story ensues. Right. But, um, when we come back, I want to talk about some of the amazing things Dell is doing with packaging and some of those innovations you've talked about and uh, share some of the stories around some of the small businesses that you, uh, Dell, is helping grow as you are relying on them for various uh, parts of your supply chain. So more with uh, uh, Bruno Sarda. Director of Sustainability Operations with Dell, right after this. Your customers, employees, marketing campaigns, partners, and yes, your detractors, they're each telling a story right now about you. Where? On social media, in traditional print publications, in blog posts, on television, basically everywhere. And it's happening 24 7. In real time. Your mission? Track these stories and the sources that share them. Smartly manage them. Analyze them rapidly and discern what you should do next. What you should do now. No wonder you're tired. Well, Zigna Labs is a real-time, cross-media story tracking platform that makes your life easier. Their solution enables customers to quickly spot trends, see relevant stories unfold, and take action. So stay ahead of what the world thinks with Zignal Labs. Learn more and sign up for a free demo at zignallabs.com forward slash story. Welcome back to the business of story. And Bruno, I have one word for you. Mushrooms. (laughs) Tell us about mushrooms and Dell. Yeah, you know, that's one of those stories that's hard to to, to believe until you... um, you play it out, but uh, um, we we became interested in um, sustainable packaging materials. 
you know, when we look at our customers and what they care about in terms of what we do in sustainability, they care about everything we do, but they care especially about what impacts them. And the fact is there are two specific areas uh, that impact our customers directly. One is what happens to the technology when they're done with it. And so that's why we have the world's uh, largest technology recycling program um, currently active in 78 countries because our customers wow. really care. Yeah. And then it's what happens to all the stuff that's left over when they've unboxed our technology. And now, you know, some people still think of Dell primarily as maybe a, a consumer brand, you know, mm -hmm. because you may see the brand at Best Buy or Walmart. But the fact is, that's a very small portion of our business. Most of our business is selling a lot of technology to large organizations. So, you know, we're the number one IT provider to the healthcare sector. We sell to, I think, 99% of the Fortune 500 companies, to most uh, government agencies in the world. And so, what that means is, when we ship technology, usually there's a lot of it. And by the time it gets unpacked, there's a lot of packaging left mm -hmm. behind. And in more and more jurisdictions, um, companies or organizations, it could be cities, hospitals, schools, data centers, you name it, um, may have tipping fees to pay to dispose of waste. And, uh, and you know, more and more people uh, are becoming conscious of waste. So when you receive something that's packed with a lot of uh, styrofoam, maybe... Yeah. Um, you know, we all have this kind of visceral, it's like, oh, what am I going to do with that, you right. know? Uh, and so <clears throat> we explored this concept of, of you know, uh, rapid recyclables um, and uh, Mushroom specifically um, working with a very small startup uh, company that developed a process to use basically mushroom spores, uh, mycelium, which is the, the binding agent that makes mushrooms, to basically grow packaging. Mm -hmm. And um, the way it works is in, uh, you have molds and you inject some kind of like agricultural waste material, wheat straw or something else um, that has no nutritional or energy value. And then you inject it with mushroom spores. And in about two days, uh, you have a, um, a very solid um, uh, impact resistant, water resistant, uh, actually flame resistant mm -hmm. packaging product. Um, and you might say two days sounds like a long time to grow a packaging product. And whereas, for example, styrofoam can literally be made in a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm. But because it is so toxic, it has to be legally, it has to be off-gassed. Styrofoam. Yes. 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 Styrofoam has to be off-gassed for about two days before it can be packaged. <laughs> because if you put it right in the package after it's been made... You bit basically you'd pass out when you open the box, uh, um, when you open the box. So um, mushroom is actually our mush mushroom packaging. Um, Michael Dell has actually uh, eaten it on stage uh, once at a conference. It's actually fully edible. Uh, there's not a chemical in it. It's mm -hmm. 100% compostable. It's actually also uh, uh, recyclable with uh, with green waste. So they grow it, and it looks. It comes out just like the package would if it were styrofoam, but in this case, it's mushroom spores. Yes. Mushroom packaging. Yes, and it's uh, um, it's been it's been a great success story. Our our customers love it. Uh, it's allowed us to work with again a small startup uh, um, to uh, to bring a whole you know, kind of innovative way of developing materials. Uh, we've done that with now some other uh, innovative packaging material suppliers uh, who are innovating with, with uh, anything from uh, uh, this, uh, this product we use called Air Carbon, yeah. which is literally uh, from, a, from a small startup in Southern California where they're taking basically the, uh, the methane uh, coming out of, of manure from a... From a um, a feedlot uh, and turning that methane basically into a, um, a bioplastic. And uh, again, it's literally sucking CO2 out of, out of the air, air to make a, uh, a plastic uh, packaging product. So, um, and it's, it's actually considered carbon negative because it's, it's taking more carbon out of the air mm -hmm. than it's putting back into it. Uh, so, um, you know, so that's just an example of how, um, uh, Doing these things, even though you might argue, again, from a life cycle footprint perspective, it's not necessarily 
the most impactful thing. These create really amazing stories for our engineers, for our designers, for our employees, for our customers uh, to really kind of uh, illustrate the the um, what's possible. You know, our, our broader um, our broader uh, sustainability program has an envelope tagline called mm-hmm. "Powering the Possible." We believe that that's part of what we do with technology. Is we you know we put capabilities in the hands of those who will know how to use it to make wonderful mm-hmm. things happen. Well, Bruno, when we come back, I want to have you talk to our listeners about how do you share stories of sustainability. You are a sought-after speaker around the world, very recognized in this area, and yet so often when you're on stage or talking to groups that you have to speak their language. How do you cut through to these folks when you're trying to tell them a story of sustainability, especially in an industry or around sustainability that can be so polarizing to so many people? So we'll cover that right after this from one of our terrific sponsors. Did you know that on average, each of us sends around 10,000 emails each year? And what does each message include? Well, an email signature, right? Well, Angie's List realized the reach they had with their 270 employees and decided to use their email signatures to promote their flagship customer event called the Festival of Services. Angie's List dialed up Sigster to become mission control for its email signature campaign. In minutes, each employee had a Sigster-powered call to action in their email signature. In six months, the campaign had been viewed more than 2 million times, resulting in 4,500 visits to the registration portal, or 38% of all visits, which meant Sixter drove more engagement than any other track marketing activity. Now, if you want to ignite the most ubiquitous and overlooked promotional channel in your business from one simple platform, visit Sixter.com. That's S-I-G-S-T-R dot com. And see how they will help you message, measure, and manage your email signature marketing. Hey, if it's good enough for Angie, it's good enough for me. All right. Welcome back, Bruno. Business of Story has been a great show so far. And as we uh, start coming to the end of the show, I want to talk a little bit about some of your secrets. How do you share these stories of sustainability with groups that maybe are disinterested, don't understand it? We all know that sustainability means a lot of things to a lot of different people, so it's not even a great term that we can really hang something on. So if you could share with us some of your ideas on how do you connect with people, the uninitiated, ininitiated, uninitiated, <laughs> sustainability. Sure. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's it's important to quickly get past this, you know, language like sustainability or sustainable because, you know... Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we want to create desired future outcomes that most people would want. And I think that's that's one of the things I try to do is try to understand what would most people agree with. Uh, and, and again, whether it's sustainability, climate, whatever, those things not only are, are sometimes obscure, but they can also be, as you mentioned, polarizing. Um, and and again, you know, somebody once famously said, you know, if I described my marriage as sustainable, you would kind of look at me like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, so <laughs> sustainable is important, but it's not necessarily something we really aspire to. So sustainability um, is a pathway to something better. It's not an end in itself. So I think that's the first important thing to remember is to always paint sustainability as a way, as a means to the end and not the end. And so then understanding, so what is the end of the audience? Um, uh, Knowing that also part of how you get their attention, especially maybe if you think they might be a little bit, you know, skeptical Mm -hmm. or even potentially hostile or, or, um, is you surprise them, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think part of how I surprise them is I bring some very strong um, business language to this conversation. I often get remarks of, wow, you didn't sound like a sustainability person at all. You sounded like a business guy. And I'd say, well, I am. I just happen to do it through sustainability. So, you know, um, like we say, at Dell, we do three things in sustainability. Um, If you ask me, what do we do? Uh, We do three things. We help drive the business. We help reduce risk and ensure business continuity. And we help enhance the brand. Um, Now, Everybody at Dell wants that. Everybody wants more business, less risk, and, and, and better brand, right? How we do that 
is sustainability. Um, and then, so the proof points are, how do we know that, right? We know that because, again, we pay attention to what our customers are doing. We know our customers, by an overwhelming majority, have their own sustainability programs, overwhelmingly look to their suppliers and their supply chains to be part of their sustainability story. Um, we bring uh, facts, but also um, uh, examples, success stories. You know, uh, uh, again, recently uh, I was asked by a very large uh, European customer um, to actually come talk to their entire procurement organization about sustainable procurement in IT uh, because of the accolades we've been receiving in, um, in sustainability. So I think you surprise your audience with things they don't necessarily expect. You know, when they, so again, director of sustainability operations, they expect me to either come up <laughs> on stage and talk about how we're building our, making our buildings more energy efficient or how we're making even our products more energy efficient or, or our suppliers more accountable. And sure, we do all that. Mm -hmm. But that's not what I come up and talk about. What I come up and talk about is say, how do we better serve our customers? How do we better engage our employees? How do we better manage our business? How do we improve our bottom line? And, and all the things we do in sustainability feed into that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think certainly with most audiences that resonates very well. You know, sometimes if it's an audience maybe of students or an audience of maybe um, environmentalists or, or um, even regulators, you know, then you go a little bit quicker into uh, some of your credentials mm -hmm. in terms of how you're uh, supporting specific things. And I, maybe I'll talk about the work we did uh, in Madagascar to actually protect the whole eastern side um, of Madagascar, this huge project we did over five years with Conservation International to to protect the last known habitat of the great lemurs and working mm -hmm. with communities to teach them how to make more by protecting their forest than by destroying it so that you know they saw an improved livelihood from maintaining a healthy forest as opposed to cutting it down which oh by the way then helps the yeah. carbon sink that is the forest and it helps all the creatures that live in it including the great lemurs which is their you know again last known habitat or the work we do with our uh, planet tree program right here in the US and that we've planted you know close to a million trees uh, already with this program um, uh, which is you know several times the areas of Central Park um, just by, by virtue of engaging our customers. Mm -hmm. This is all through customer directed uh, uh, activities uh, with this planet tree program. And I would imagine that is just completely changing the stories that customers are telling themselves about Dell. And I would imagine a lot of our listeners too think of Dell computer as that laptop or that first computer you had sitting in your dorm room and then the first home you owned, yeah. the first business you started, and you think of Dell and Michael Dell as simply a technology company. But with your line of work, you are completely redefining that story for a lot of people, what Dell stands for. Yeah. No, and, and again, it, it always helps to, to, again, if you can challenge something that people already believe about you, then it makes it easier for them to maybe wonder, well, what else did I, don't I know? Or what else do I think I know that I don't? Um, you know, like, uh, again, depending on the audience, but uh, if it's a kind of a tech audience, we'll talk about our, our rooftop data center in, in uh, Chandler, Arizona, that we've built in, with eBay that is only cooled basically with fresh air. This is a data center that does not have powered cooling that's sitting on a rooftop outside in 115 degree temperature and people just like shake their head in disbelief but wait that can't happen data centers are usually run at like less than 70 degree temperature and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in electricity just to cool mm -hmm. it's like yep you're right but not anymore yeah and then you know all of a sudden you have their attention it's like how's this possible how's this done and what else are you doing yeah. so um find the tension in the story exactly and then show them how you are responding to that tension that's awesome. right yeah. and then i think the last thing i'll say frankly is um, and that's been really, really important throughout. And I think Dell has, I honestly think we've done that pretty well over the years, um, is be authentic mm -hmm. and, and be transparent and don't try to be more than you are. Um, and, you know, I think companies that have been accused of greenwashing or whatever uh, often try to tell a story that is either ahead of its time or, uh, or just the story they wish they could tell as opposed to the story they really should tell. Um, and so I think just being authentic and, and not being afraid of what will happen, even if what you have to say isn't necessarily the most 
you know, as marketers, we always try to use superlatives and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I was reflecting recently about, you know, organizations that have put themselves out there either by being very transparent about the good, the bad, and the ugly, like Patagonia comes mm -hmm. to mind, or uh, of, again, it's like, here's everything that we don't like, and here's how we're going to improve it. But mm -hmm. by, in order to talk about how you want to improve it, you have to shine a light on things that people may not have seen before in your supply chain, in your product, in your operations. And, and honestly, I cannot think of a single example where an organization was made to regret being transparent and authentic when it comes to sustainability. I can think of many examples that organizations regretted being too opaque, uh, throwing lawyers and, and all kinds of people out of question as opposed to just being open and honest about it. So I think there's a great lesson there. Yeah, you don't get in trouble for the act, you get tr in trouble for the cover-up. Yeah. And I think this has been a very consistent theme with all of our guests about the power of story comes down to what you said of being authentic and embracing the conflict in our lives, in our businesses, in our brands, and then being honest, open, and authentic about how we go about addressing those conflicts because that's where the tension is. And that's really where we all make hay in business and in our personal lives. Yeah. yeah. No, we, we find we, we have a tremendous amount of champions and supporters, people who root for us. And, and, you know, we run into people who don't really have a stake either way, but they say, you know, we really rooting for you, really like what you're trying to do. And, and I want you to succeed, you know, and that all that positive energy is, is very motivating. Uh, well, thank you, Bruno. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here in the Business of Story. All right. Thanks, Park. All right, and thank you all for listening to The Business of Story. As you know, if you want to download our free storytelling tools, please go to businessofstory.com. If you like what you're hearing, please give us a rating and a review. If you don't like what you're hearing, let me know. If you would like to hear other things, if there are other topics that you would like us covering, please send me an email through thebusinessofstory.com. And always, uh, as always, please subscribe, share it with your world, because we are all about helping you connect in a bigger, better way with your audiences to help them move them to action. So thank you for listening to another edition of The Business of Story. Thanks for tuning in to The Business of Story. Don't forget there are terrific free storytelling resources for you at thebusinessofstory.com, where you'll also find the complete show archive. The Business of Story is sponsored by Oracle Marketing Cloud, Park & Co., Sixter, Zignal Labs, and ACT, and is produced by Convince & Convert Media. Find more great shows like The Business of Story at marketingpodcasts.com, the first search engine for marketing podcasts.